So in light of the, the, all the news about the coronavirus and, and the panic of all that this week, the, the joke is that all the stores are out of toilet paper. Everybody's stocking up on toilet paper. Um, on Friday, the local, my wife was in the local supermarket, and, and they said that they had run out of toilet paper the night before. They got a shipment in. They stocked it in the morning, and within two or three hours, the shelves were all bare. Someone said they went to Sam's Club on Friday in the parking lot, overflowed to the point where there were no parking spots left, and the line of people was out the door. I think we all have stories of that this week in the, in the craziness of the world we're living in in this week. As the week progressed, it seems like the news got worse and worse, and, and I was looking at it on a day-by-day -day basis, and it, but in fact, it turned into an hour-by-hour -hour basis as the week progressed. And it seems like the, the panic of the week just kind of set in and as the week went on, it began to rise exponentially. One psychologist I heard interviewed this week explained the phenomena of hoarding things. He said in times of fear, in times of chaos, in times of the unknown, people will grab for whatever they can to find a sense of stability, to find a sense of security, to find a sense of even civility. And in this case... It's toilet paper and it's sanitizing products and it's canned goods that are offering that sense of security. I heard of one church canceling their worship services this week, like many are doing, due to the virus and the fear. And they said it was the first time in over 100 years that the church had canceled services. I think they said 108 years. The last time they canceled a service was during another pandemic. In my lifetime, possibly even in my parents' lifetime, this type of hysteria and fear is unprecedented, even in light of 9-11 and those kinds of events. So as followers of Christ, our minds are flooded with all kinds of questions and concern. How are we to respond in, in, in faith in the face of such fear? How do we keep our own fears fueled by the constant media frenzy out there from consuming our hearts? How do we find the balance between ignoring the issue and overreacting in fear? And beyond that, how do we let our faith lead the way in our lives so that we can be a testimony to the world around us? Ephesians 2 reminds us of this great salvation that we have been given. Verse 4 says, and I want you to pay attention to this, but God being rich in mercy, and I've, I've got that underlined in my text here, rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You see, in Jesus Christ, God has poured out his mercy on us. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 tells us that God is the father of mercies. And Psalm 91, let me read that for us here. Psalm 91 says this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This, this idea speaks about the dwelling of his shelter. It talks about abiding in his shadow. In the Middle Eastern culture, here's, a, here's an interesting thing that goes with this idea of shadow. In the Middle Eastern culture, hospitality meant coming under one's roof, coming under the roof of someone else's home and living under their protection, under their provision. It, it, it means living in the shade of their home. Now, the Hebrew word for shade is the same word that's used for mercy. And so if we read it again, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shade, in the mercy, in the provision, in the protection of the Almighty. His mercy poured out on us. It's because of the richness of his mercy, God's mercy in our lives that we are saved and that we're given the promise of new life and the hope of a future. But in the same letter to the Ephesian church, Paul writes about the fullness of God's plan. It's believers in Jesus Christ who are gathered together in community. That's the church. And Paul tells us that the church, his people, 
is the recipient and the display of his mercy, of his kindness, of his blessing. And according to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, all the angels and all the beings of the heavenly realm are watching the church, that's us, and they're watching the church to see God's mercy on display. And so what does that mean for us today? How do we, as believers and recipients of that mercy, the mercy of God, how do we reflect the glory of God in the midst of a crisis? How can we let faith rule our lives while fear rules the world? And how do we take this mercy that's been given to us and reflect it back onto the world? You see, as the church, we need not run in fear. The church is led by the Holy Spirit, and the church is given the strength of God by the Holy Spirit for difficult days just like this. You see, brothers and sisters, we've been invited to live in his shadow, in his shade. We've been invited to live in the mercy of God. And as the church, more than hiding, we can be active agents of mercy and compassion to the world around us. Ours is indeed a high calling. Ours is indeed a high commission from God himself for days like this. We, we see this lived out in the people of the, of the first church. Those that came after, after Christ's resurrection and the church was born as they lived it out in the light of the Roman Empire. From the very beginning, the church has been an agency of compassion, of mercy, and of healing, when indeed the world ran away in fear. The believers living in the Roman Empire can teach us much of what it means to live as witnesses for Christ in perilous times. So I'd like to look at that, if I could, for just a moment. What was the culture like? What was it like to be witnesses in the time of a plague? So when I think about the Roman Empire, my mind goes in several directions. And I, I admit, and probably for most of us, Hollywood seems to set the course for the images of the Roman Empire. Yes, we know that life was difficult, and we, yes, we know that it was probably even violent, but mostly my image of the Roman Empire is that of wealth. It's that of glorious cities and roads and, and architecture. A picture of the Roman Empire is that of powerful political figures all through history. But as we look at history, as we take a closer look at history, we have to realize that for the average person living in the Roman Empire, life was less than comfortable. In the major cities, there was terrible overcrowding. Terrible overcrowding. They built houses with multiple levels. They built them close together. The streets were, were, were tight. And, it, and the, the, the houses that were built higher with several levels, several floors, the poorer you were, the more you went up in the buildings. Your apartment was probably on the top floor. You had to climb all the stairs to get to your place. The problem was that they didn't have the engineering for that kind of height in, in, uh, in living spaces. And this is a surprise to me, but apartments were prone to falling down in, in the large cities. And so you lived with that sense of danger all the time. And plus, they didn't have water in, in many of their homes. And the sources for water and sanitation were often far away from the house. And so cleanliness and personal hygiene were seen as luxuries. Carrying water up the street and then up the stairs was a huge task. And plus, there was, there was no indoor plumbing. And there were no indoor bathrooms. Chamber pots were the order of the day. And excuse the the image of this, but often chamber pots were emptied by simply pouring the contents out the window and onto the street. And woe to the person who happened to be walking by. The streets in these overcrowded cities were quite narrow, possibly only 10 to 12 feet wide, unlike our streets today. And yet they carried all kinds of traffic from pedestrians and busy, busy streets full of people going here and there, but it also included horses and all kinds of livestock and they too contributed to the sights and smells of a Roman neighborhood. Sewage removal consisted of ditches along the street. So you get the idea. Life in a Roman city, an overcrowded Roman city, was smelly and it was wretched. Now there's archaeological evidence that a common malady for people was, was that of tapeworm. 
in these unsanitary conditions, the simplest of illnesses got completely out of control. And history shows that two major plagues ransacked Roman cities. And it's not hard to see why in these conditions. Accounts of these plagues describe horrible conditions. When someone in, in the home, a family member, showed symptoms, they were, they were simply put out on the street for fear of contamination. They put out to, to deal with it on their own with no help, no, no mercy, no comfort, no, no attempt at healing. Hundreds and thousands suffered and died in the streets of Rome. And removing them from the streets was a monumental task. And on top of that, people would go to the temples to pray. And they would go to the temples to seek compassion from their gods, only to find out that the pagan priests, in light of the plague and in light of all the danger, had already fled the city. No priests. And the gods they worshipped were fickle. And they were only concerned for themselves. And so there was little solace for the sick, for the vulnerable, for the fearful to be found in, in the gods of the day. A prevailing, a prevailing mindset of the Roman Empire was that of, was, was, a prevailing mindset of the Roman Empire was not that of compassion and mercy. Compassion and mercy were considered to be signs of weakness, signs of a weak character in people. So that was not a value of the day. So helping to provide one another with medical care and showing hospitality to those in need simply were not community values. In times of plague and epidemic, those caught in the suffering were cast out and they were left to fend for themselves. So enter the Christians, enter the church, because their view of God was that of mercy God's mercy being poured out, God's love being poured out, they saw the world through another lens. So having received mercy, they were eager to give it away. So instead of fleeing the city, they remained behind to care for their own. They ministered healing and compassion to those around them. Yes, indeed, it was to their family first and to the family of believers, but they never refused help to others. In fact, they sought to minister to those outside of their own fellowship. So it's amazing what happened. It's been shown that Christians in those days lived longer. They took care of one another. They helped to heal one another. They ministered to one another. And it's, it's amazing what simple things like, like the things that are marking our headlines today, washing hands, cleaning out wounds, providing food, providing water. It's amazing what those simple things did in the midst of a plague. There was survival. There was life. So in those days, it didn't take a rocket scientist to compare the worldviews of Roman paganism compared to Christian compassion and grace. You see, hospitality and love carried the weight of a powerful witness to a world that was literally dying. So we find ourselves in a very strange place today. I could never have predicted that we would be canceling worship services for the reasons that we are today. I could never imagine that kind of panic and fear spreading so quickly across our nation, across the globe. Indeed, we all need to take the necessary precautions to protect family and friends and protect ourselves, but we also need to care for the vulnerable in our midst. It's, I can't help but wonder what the role of the church is in our culture today. We all know that the church is not a building or it, the church is not contained in four walls. The church is the family of faith. The church is the gathering of all those who call on the name of Jesus. So what happens then if, if we take out our meeting time? What happens if we take out our corporate worship time? What does it mean to be the church in, in the midst of such a societal wave of fear and confusion? I have to ask myself, how did the believers in the New Testament, the church in Rome, how did they live as witnesses in those difficult days? I have to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 because Peter is writing to the, the diaspora. Peter is writing to Christians who have been scattered out across Asia and they're feeling alone. They're feeling secluded in times of pending persecution. They're away from, from the heartbeat of of, of Christianity that was back in Jerusalem and, and those familiar places, and they're out by themselves. So Peter's writing to them, and this is what he says. 
Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So what is Peter saying to these people who are feeling the, the, the pending persecution, sensing the, 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 a, a sense of loneliness? What did he have to say to them? First of all, he knew, that believer knew what God had done for them. Peter talks about the inheritance that we have kept in heaven for us, protected by God. They knew what God had done for them. They knew his mercy that had been poured out. They knew the power of his resurrection at work in their lives. So Peter reminded them of that. And the believers in that culture knew, they knew their future. They knew that they would, that God would see them through this trial, this difficulty, this day, see them through to glory. The work that he was beginning in them, he would finish. They knew their future. They knew their hope. And so that hope and that, that future glory, that put their trials in, so, in some kind of a context. So, so the, the third thing that they understood is that they could put their trials in that, in that framework, future glory, future hope. They knew there was a coming time when their faith would become sight. And they knew there was coming a time when all would be made whole in Jesus Christ. And that gave them freedom to live with grace and compassion in the midst of difficulties. And finally, from this passage, we see that they sought the glory of Jesus above all else. Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice. They sought the glory of Jesus above all else. You see, they were more concerned. They were more concerned about his work in their life than they were about the present trials. His grace, his love, his mercy being poured out was much more important to them than any trial that they could face during the day. So they knew their inheritance. The second thing they did is that they chose faith over fear. We all remember the image of the firefighters of 9-11 running up the stairwell, stairwell of the building while everyone else fled to go downstairs and out of the buildings. And we all stood amazed. We still stand amazed at their courage in the face of what for most of us would be a tremendous, great sense of fear. In the same way, the believers of Rome stayed in the city while, while the rest of the people of, of the city fled to the country. When the priests chose to flee, believers stayed. When family members left their own to die on the streets, believers took them in. Now, I don't want to minimize their risk because, in fact, many of them caught the plague and many of them died themselves. But they chose to walk in faith and they chose to put the fear aside. One of the most prominent commands and promises in scripture is that of do not fear. Do not fear. It's a natural human response. But faith displaces fear. It operates in spite of fear. Faith overcomes when we place our trust in Jesus Christ for our lives and for the hope that he has for us. It seems to me that in all of our conversations today, fear is always lurking in the shadows. Some will acknowledge its presence. Some will, will declare as if to make a proclamation, I will not succumb to fear. And as believers, we will not shrink back because of Jesus Christ. So they understood their inheritance. They chose faith over fear. And the final thing is that they chose to serve. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle John tells us that we love because God first loved us. You see, 
John goes on to explain that we can't hate our brother and say that we love God at the same time. Loving God means loving, serving, and blessing others. Now, we couldn't have planned this out, but our recent series on the blessed principle is proving to be timely. You see, we are called as, as followers of Christ to be a blessing to others. Let's review. What does, the, what does the blessed principle mean? It means be in prayer, active listening, eating together, serving one another, and sharing your faith. These unusual circumstances that we face today, seen in this light, are not, are not a time of fear, but a time of opportunity to display the mercy of Jesus. Church, we are called to be a blessing in these days. Many of the letters in the New Testament begin with a greeting to the church, to the beloved saints, to the church in, in Galatia, to the church in, in Ephesus, to the church in Philippi, to the elect, Peter says in 1 Peter 1. And may I say to you today, to the church of Chaska, to the family of Valley, for you have been set apart for new life in Christ. You have been set apart for a future hope and a future glory. And if I could say this to the, to the, to the beloved family of Valley Free, may you walk in confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today. May your faith grow and not shrink back. May your testimony of Jesus be a light to those around you. And so we, though we miss our, our fellowship together, and that's, that's really important to us here at Valley Free Church, we love gathering together. And though we're missing that on Sunday mornings, may our hearts be attuned to the needs of our, our, our neighbors, our co-workers, fellow students, our family. And may our, may our witness be amplified as we seek to be a light and a blessing to the world around us. Brothers and sisters, now is the time as a church, as followers of Christ, to rise up and be the church. Firm in faith, faithful in our witness. I'd like to conclude today by offering you a testimony from our sister, Barb Kreider. If you know, Barb Kreider has been struggling with, with illness for the last few months, and I won't tell her story, but she has been kind enough to record her story for us and share a few words of encouragement to us today. So I'd like you to take a few additional moments this morning and let Barb share her story of faith in the midst of tremendous difficulties. And I pray that her story would bless you and strengthen you today. Let me pray for us before we go to Barb's testimony. Lord Jesus, these are the days that, that um, the world is in fear and, and there's chaos and, and uh, we don't want to overstate it. But I think that it's, as we have said, fear is lurking behind the scenes and in the shadows for most people today. So we claim your promises as your children, as your family, as your beloved, Lord Jesus, we pray in, in the confidence of your power, your resurrection power, that we may stand firm in our culture today. Lord Jesus, help us to displace the fear. By your Holy Spirit, bring faith to us. Strengthen our faith. Make our faith even more profound this day as we face into the headwinds of a confused culture. Lord Jesus, keep us safe. Keep us moving towards you. Keep us growing in, in who you are and trusting you. And may we be a blessing today. May we be taking time to call our neighbors, to check in on our neighbors, to ask them how they're doing. And may we be quick to share the hope that we find in you, Lord Jesus. So I ask your blessing on our Valley Free family as we are dispersed this week and next. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.